Okay. I'm going to step down here and just read it right off the screen. Uh, we're going to start this morning with, uh, with Joshua. Yes, Joshua. Um, it's chapter 10, 1 through 15. Uh, I kind of had to chuckle last week. Mark said that when he was reading all those complicated names, he just read them with, with authority uh, because there's a good chance that none of you know how to say it either. Um, I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was, a, as an, was an important city. Like one of the royal cities, it was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, are there any veterans in here today? <laughs> yeah. Then you know what marching is, don't you? <laughs> I can't imagine an all night, that, that catches me every time, an all night, thank you for your service by the way, but an all night march, and then you're gonna fight, okay. An all night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Mecca. As they fled before Israel on the road before the before oh my goodness fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah the Lord hurled hailstones down on them and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the, day the Lord, on, that, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord, In the presence of Israel, sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jasher, the sun stopped in the middle of the, of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. And in Ephesians, um, I, uh, yeah, the reference for this, it's uh, 117. Yeah, 117, Ephesians 117. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Okay. A couple things I want to start with. Thanks for bearing with me. That's kind of a long story. It's a fairly big chunk of scripture. I was just going to like... Um, summarize it for you, but I thought, no, that kind of goes against something I'm going to say later, and I thought, I better not. Let's just read it. I'm glad we did, because there's a couple things that I want to, I want to bring out of that, um, and it's at verse 8, and this is in Joshua, at verse 8, the Lord said to Joshua. Now, we read that, and we, we, we don't, uh, it usually doesn't even raise an eye. 
the Lord said to Joshua. And then a little bit later down, uh, in verse 11, it says, The Lord hurled ha large hailstones down on them. You know, there's all kinds of ways that we can communicate. Two very powerful ways is to speak and then act. And God used both of those. God spoke and told Joshua, this is gonna, you're going to be fine. You're going to win this. And then God joined in the fighting, enforcing what Joshua was doing. Words and action. And in Paul, there's two words I would like to pull out of the whole, that, that whole sentence there. The first word is wisdom. It's wise to know God. It is a wise choice to seek God. Proverbs is a book filled with that sentence, actually, that it is wise to seek God. The other word is revelation, and that's a word that basically means to reveal. And there's a third word that comes before that that's very powerful, especially for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, and that's the word spirit. God, he's asking God to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation can only come from the Holy Spirit. And Paul's asking God for that for you. Know God. Joshua knew God, and you should know God. And Paul wants you to know God. Paul wants the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and revelation so that you can know God better. Okay, so to, um, uh, to kind of boil this down and make it plain, if we're going to do something, we need to be motivated to do it. Have you ever done something that you weren't motivated to do? I mean, yeah, but it's like, it's, it's like swimming through mayonnaise, isn't it? It's really, it's really hard to do something you're not motivated to do. So let's talk a little bit about motivation. Um, I could ask, uh, you know, what do you have to lose uh, by knowing God? But I think the better question is actually, what do you have to gain? What is there to gain by knowing God? What am I going to get out of it? And that sounds like a, maybe a little bit irreverent when we're talking about Jesus Christ, doesn't it? But if, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we're human beings, we need motivation, and usually the motivation is, what am I going to get out of it? When I first met Debbie, we met at the beach. Does anybody know that? It doesn't really matter, but it's just a, yeah, anyway. When I first met her, uh, there's a couple things that I learned about her pretty quickly, actually. It was, it was on our first date, even though we didn't know it was a first date. Um, uh, she loves roller coasters, uh, she's very competitive, she loves God, and she's a nurse. That's, that's what I, oh yeah. And she was, she, was, she was cute, too. She still is. Too. That, that didn't hurt. That was motivation, right? Motivation. I was motivated. The more I learned, the more I wanted to know. The more I knew about her, the more I realized that there was a promising future with a girl like that. That's motivation. I started to, be, uh, uh, to get a pretty good idea of what I was going to get. And I ha haven't really been wrong. So 33 years later, you know, we, we can finish each other's sentences. Uh, we know what's annoying about each other. Uh, probably more me than you. Our tastes in food, entertainment, idiosyncrasies, etc. I could order her dinner. She could pick out clothes on Amazon for me, and she'd, she'd get it right. It's because we know each other. And we have spent 33 years, actually it's more like 34 years, getting to know each other. But honestly, I'd still like to know her better. When Joshua ordered the sun and moon to stay, he was ordering what God wanted. God told Joshua that his enemies would not be able to withstand him. God joined in the fight and killed more than even Joshua's army. Joshua knew that there was victory in a relationship with God. Joshua knew what he was getting with his relationship with God. There's victory in knowing God. Josh was motivated. It mattered if he knew God. It mattered for him. It mattered for his army. It mattered for his entire nation. I could say that about each of us. 
us knowing God matters for us, it matters for our families, and it matters for our nation and the world. Motivation. Frankly, we're motivated by uh, what we're going to get. And what I'm going to get is a fair question. So we should probably answer the question, what are you going to get? So let's talk about what you're going to get with a relationship with God. And I lost my place. Oh, yes, let's talk about what we're going to get. <laughs> yes, it's important to remember Joshua's battle that day was against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is a battle nonetheless. Our tools are not flesh and blood tools like swords and javelins and slings, but we still need tools if there is a battle. And indeed, I would argue that there is. All you need to know can be found in 10 minutes on the news that there is a battle waging, a spiritual battle. Our tools are faith, forgiveness, love, joy, goodness, peace, self-control, kindness, hope. Now these are found all throughout the Bible. They've been promised and given throughout the Bible. You can find many of them plainly laid out in 1 Corinthians 13 and in Galatians 5. Those are some of the things that you're going to get. Of course, yes, they're tools. And honestly, I mean, I don't know about you, but I could use some tools. And like me, you've probably had some battles in your life. Honestly, a month ago, Debbie and I were having a battle. And a bunch of these tools were applied. But these are just a taste of what you find in a relationship with God. I guess most of all, it's His presence from moment to moment. And I honestly, it's hard for me to explain that part of it to you if you've not already experienced it. So now that I've laid that out, we, we need to be motivated. What am I gonna get? That's our, that's our motivation. I'd like to, to lay out five things that if you would like to know God, or you would like to know God more, you want a closer relationship with Him, these five things will help you out with that. It's not a perfect list, but it's a darn good start. Okay. First of all, it's time. It takes time. Have you ever known somebody really well without spending time with them? Now, ironically, we live in a strange world right now. We live in a world of, of, of digital friendships, and there's more loneliness now than there has ever been, because that, those relationships don't really take any time. Time praying, talking to God, telling Him about your troubles, fears, joys, frustrations, mistakes, everything. Time. In Psalm 91, I think it's verse 1, it says something about when you dwell with God, you can rest under the wing of the Almighty. Time. Imagine resting and dwelling with God. That takes time. The next one is meditation. Now, this is a kind of a, a tricky word because oftentimes, and I know for myself, when somebody brings up the word meditation, I start thinking of Far East religions and gurus and, and some strange stuff, right? We hear the word meditation, it can be that way. You can, uh, it brings up those connotations. But honestly, Christians and Jews alike, they, they have a, a deep history in meditation. 
There's, in fact, there was a whole movement where people would, would seclude themselves so that they could just quietly remove all the busyness from their mind and their lives and concentrate on meditating in the presence of God. If you ever visited a monastery, that's, that's kind of what that building was for. And you really can't, can't have... Um, you can't have time and meditation um, without um, a quantity of that time and meditation. I always, uh, there, for a long time, there was that whole thing of um, you, can have, you don't have to have a lot of time, you just have to have a quality time. I would argue that you can't have quality time without a quantity of it, a good quantity of it. So time, meditation. The third one is read. Read, read, read. God gave us a textbook, a manual, basic instructions before leaving earth. I always like that. Read God's Word. Now here's the thing. I'm not anti other books. I'm not. There's lots of really great books out there. But I would like you to set that aside because I, I have some friends that will read um, multiple books, hundreds and hundreds of pages, and they can barely manage to read a verse a day in the Bible. Now, if I was to say which is more imper important, God's Word or what somebody else is saying about God's Word, honestly, there's a lot of questionable material out there, questionable Christian material, until you are rooted and founded in God's Word for yourself. Leave those books alone. You don't have any business looking in those books until you have come to terms with God's Word for yourself. Now, there's lots of uh, study helps and so forth. I'm not talking about those necessarily. I'm just talking about, okay, let's go back to the original. You need to read God's Word every day. Read God's Word. I'm not saying that you have to like bust that thing open and read a chapter and a half or two chapters, especially if you're going through Chronicles or something like that. That can be a little dizzying. I'm just saying, start reading God's Word and read God's Word and understand it for yourself. So that's read, 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 read. The next one is study. Now, some people think that studying is reading. Nope, studying is not reading. Um, reading is reading. Studying is more making a part of what you've read, what you've, the knowledge or the information you've received. Now, that is making it a part of who you are. I know like when you're studying for a test, um, you don't just, well, sometimes you just read, you may read a chapter over and over again, but eventually you have to start owning the information. It has to start becoming a part of you. Can you imagine Joshua, his jet black hair dripping with blood and sweat, he circles under his and all his men's eyes, and the first thing on his mind is what God wants. God said that this, none of them will be able to withstand us. There's still some of them that have not withstood us yet. <laughs> There's work to be done. The only, th the only solution here is we need more day. Joshua had studied. He knew God. He knew what God wanted. And he demanded it. And he got it. And that's from studying. Studying is reasoning things out for yourself and making them a part of who you are. The last one, number five, so we've done time, meditation, read, study, now share. I bet you you're thinking, I'm going to tell you to share the gospel with your friends, families, co-workers, etc. Nope, I'm not. Because honestly, if you don't take the time, you don't meditate with God, you don't read, and you don't study, I don't want you sharing anything. Zip it. What I want you to share is with other believers. This is a, a, an amazing part of a deeper, closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's start sharing with each other what we've read, what we've studied, what we've pondered, experienced, and learned. That actually sounds like church, doesn't it? We come here and we share God's Word, we talk about it, maybe even argue about it. I've got a couple good friends that I, we argue some good theological points, and there is tension between us. That's because they're reading and I'm reading, 
And we might come to something and we're like, well, I don't know. And now all of a sudden, but there's amazing growth in that. There's a, a, a way that we can come to a deeper and more meaningful understanding and also become more rooted in what we've come to believe. It's why we have denominations, actually. Our denomination has come to terms with what we believe. We even have a book called We Believe. <laughs> and in there is what we've determined we believe. The more people that know an individual, the more a person is known. Is that fair? I'm going to put a little twist on it. What if those people start talking to each other about that individual? I'll give you an example. Okay, so I know this guy at work, okay? But then at the company party, I meet his wife, and I have a chance to talk to her a little bit, and I learn some things about him I didn't know. It's going to be fun on Monday because I'm going to go back and tease him about it. But now I know more about him, don't I? And then at the, maybe at the company picnic, or I see them at the grocery store, and I find out he's got three children. And I see the three kids running around, and one of them looks just exactly like him, and the other two look like his wife. And now I know a little bit more about him, more so, correct? Or perhaps I meet his mom or a, friend, a buddy of his from high school, and I talk to them. Do I know more about my friend from work? That's what happens when we come here and we talk about Jesus Christ. Because how you know him is beautifully unique to how I know him. Your experiences with God are unique to you to a degree that maybe I haven't experienced. But I can have that experience through talking to you and fellowshipping with you. Sharing is a powerful, powerful thing. And it can help us grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ and help us to grow closer to him and know him better. I can tell you that what I love about Jesus is the hope, love, and peace that I experience through him and because of him. Hope, love, peace. Oh, raise your hand if you have enough hope, love, and peace. Yeah, that's what I thought. There's never enough of that, is there? I'm going to point out three quick verses to you. Right after Ephesians 1.17 is 1.18. And Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in America winning. Our hope is not in this person getting elected. Our hope is not in um, the peace uh, between armies of the world. Our hope is not in financial security. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. When we put our hope in all those other things, they will fail, and they do. Even our own health fails. But hope in Jesus Christ is a hope that you can have and keep because he will not fail. Hope. In 1 Corinthians 13... At the very end of that chapter, it says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Jesus invented love. He perfected love. He is love. He is the very definition of love. In John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Hope, love, peace. The, that is what is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you may say uh, that uh, you, I, I've known God all my life. And honestly, I, I accepted Jesus when I was eight years old and I knew about Jesus before then. I can stand here and say, I've known God all my life, but I can tell you I've just scratched the surface with him. How can we know the creator of the universe? completely. In this lifetime, we never will. But the pursuit of that relationship with him, there is so much to be gained. So much to be gained. Hope, love, and peace. Remember that phrase, I think, uh, I, uh, Debbie mentioned it to me yesterday. You, sometimes you'd see it on like a church sign where it would say, no God, no peace, no God, no peace. K-N-O-W, God. K-N-O-W, peace. N-O, God. N-O, peace. 
It is a cliche now because it's been used so much, but it is so true. If you feel troubled by the world around you, or by family situations, or by a problem at work, the, 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 the solution is not fixing those things. You know, it, it's funny, I, I actually didn't mention it, but I'll, but I'll, I'll actually mention it now. You know, we, we as human beings, but I'll say specifically Christians, we're not very good listeners. In meditation, there's lots of listening. We like to solve and do. But honestly, a lot of times we do that to just cover over our own anxieties and fears when we could just lay those things down and go to God. Joshua knew God. He knew God well enough to demand what God wanted. He knew God well enough to fully expect it to happen. Josh wanted uh, what God wanted. Josh knew what God wanted because he knew God. Know God. Amen.